Hello and welcome. We have reached the end of this series for developmental psychology, and we've also reached the end of the lifespan. We are here to culminate the end. Death. We all have to die. <laughs> Sorry, but every time I give this lecture, then I have to, again, remember the downfall of humanity is the knowledge of our mortality. The consciousness comes at a cost. You know, sometimes you wonder about animals, right? And you see it with dogs and cats. Like, they have a sense of what's going on. Like, if you've ever had a pet that was about to die, for example, there is some telltale signs. And even the cat seems aware of it. and But they're not as aware of it, like, in the sense that we are. You have to ask, what's the difference between a cat and a human? And again, it's our conscious mind, that ability to reflect, the ability to sit back, step outside the box, and observe. And, you know, it's questionable whether all animals understand death or have a sense about death or how they cope and deal with it. And again, a lot of that's built into our biology. But as a human being, you are aware of it. And again, as we talked in the last lecture, at what point do you kind of become aware of it? Is it like all of a sudden at 40 it hits you that like maybe we're over the hump and, you know, it's all downhill from here? <laughs> Even though that's not the case at all, as we've discussed. There are, you know, some things that do occur as we age and you could argue that some things are declining. But as again, you know, yes, our bodies are declining. Yes, our processing speed may differ. But again, we gain in so many other areas, like we talked about with crystallized knowledge or just general wisdom or attitude toward life or just the way you think and, you know, the way you've grown over the years and become the person that you are and how your identity has solidified. And there's just so many processes that go across the lifespan. And so, again, these are just introductions to these ideas in this class. And same thing with late adulthood. Like, one chapter is not going to cover the entire experience of late adulthood. Like uh, this field of gerontology fascinates me because it's an entire field dedicated to these studies. So again, all the little things that I've introduced you to in this class are in themselves whole fields of studies, right? Like looking at um, the evolution of the body and the evolution of the brain and the neuroscience of the structure itself, taking a cognitive psychological approach and looking at how our thinking evolves over time, taking a positive psychological approach and looking at ways of becoming self-actualized and building self-esteem and self-worth and living that great life that we want to, reducing that disparity between our dreams and our reality so that we are living out our dreams Becoming the full person that we are, for example, you know, a holistic approach, you know, of like all the parts of your life and who you are as a person, the way you feel, all those things come together, for example. We can take a behaviorist approach and look at how through stimulus and response we have learned to react to stimuli in the environment in a much more efficient way, for example. Um, looking at operant conditioning, you know, um, same thing, how we are seeking rewards our whole life, and even through creativity or relationships or through family, we're seeking rewards, right? And then you have other approaches, like a Freudian, you know, perspective or a psychodynamic perspective where, you know, you're discovering yourself and your unconscious mind is communicating with your conscious mind and you're trying to, you know, regulate the two where whatever's going on inside your head to make you feel the way you feel you want to make sure that you're in tune with that with your conscious mind and you're living out that life experience so again we can apply all kinds of theories to this approach um, but again it's a big study and so but is this the beginning of the end you know and, and that's a tough question and i think that a lot of what this chapter deals with with the psychology of it all, especially when we get into things like death and dying and grieving and loss throughout life and all of these other processes, you know, why are we interested in this psychologically? And again, it's, it, it's, it's diverse, one from a philosophical standpoint of searching for meaning of life or whatever it might be, or what is the processes of death and dying and how does that evolve? And, you know, then other approaches that we might think about is... You know, 
how do we feel about our lives? And, you know, these are the tough questions. And so when what you might deal with that question as a psychologist, for example, like, you know, I kind of go to the therapy as an example all the time. But, you know, what about just being as an individual? And that's where I kind of pause for a second, because psychology is not just interested in just the field itself. It is also that human experience, right? And that's why I kind of introduced the idea of philosophy, but even that is not specific enough. I think the idea of the human experience, you know, why are we studying this? It's, it's more than just development of the body or the structure of the brain. It's also the human experience, which involves all of our cognitions, emotions, feelings, motivations, compounded with the social context that we create by interacting with other people. And so our lives are so full. You have this biological nature of you and who you are as a person. And then you have all of this stuff going on in your head. And then you have all of these experiences outside in the social context. And so if you really want to understand a person, again, like we talked about last lecture, you have to understand the biological person. Who is their temper, you know, their genetic self, their temperament. And that personality is like your biopsychosocial self. That person that you are biologically that interacts with, you know, your cognitive approaches to life that also interacts with, you know, you in the social context and all of your experiences. And so again, another theoretical approach to late adulthood is looking at more of an observational sense, you know, as we're at this point in our late adulthood, looking at maybe social learning theory of Bandura, you know, we're asking ourselves, how do we match up? Like, what was our life? Was it good? When you observe others and model and imitate other people, were you successful in living out that full life, you know? And then what is meaning all about is not just what you're socialized, like religions and spirituality and all of that, but also what's going on in your head. Because the, psych the social psychology of it is, right, like you have all of this socialization from the social context and you're observing your entire life and then you're kind of molding your personality around those observations but again you also have some choice over the person you are to be and so as we observe and watch and experience life as a human and feel what it's like to be a human through our biological self you know again we can sit back and observe and ask these questions and again, that's the downfall of our own mortality, you know, our kind of idea is the idea that we are aware, you know, not only through observation do we observe what we're supposed to do with our lives, but also through observation we realize that one day our life will end. And I mean, that knowledge in itself can cause a lot of pressures and stresses, some that motivate us to do great things with our life, but other pressures and stresses that cause a lot of stress and depression, anxiety, worry. I mean, again, I might, you know, totally have those fears of death and then watching my own parents have to go through things, you know, and then knowing that I'm going to have to go through what they're going through. And like, you know, that is just to be able to take that in is hard. And so, again, is the human experience tough? Is there a lot of struggle? Is the knowledge that we're going to have to die one day and our bodies are getting older? Does this weigh on us over time? And then how does that affect our cognitive experience of reality, for example, right? And so, again, it's all ridiculously complex. But that's the beauty of psychology and sociology and biology is it's just they're all interconnected, right? But there, it just takes so much knowledge to be able to understand how they're all interconnected and how all the parts work together. Like nobody has an answer to, you know, do you only have one true self or do you have multiple selves, you know, or th questions like that. And again, in developmental psychology, we're basically saying that we're constantly evolving throughout the lifespan. There's no one time in our lives where things are like necessarily stagnant, whether it's our physical body changing or the way we think is changing or emotions are changing or the way we deal with situations in the social context are changing or general life experiences like trauma or divorce or meeting a new best friend or having a really great experience all of these things can also affect us so you have to be thinking about the good things and the bad things then again what we label are good and bad of course are culturally you know labels or cultural labels we're the ones who decide what's good and bad right and wrong morality things along those lines but 
you know, again, this late adulthood is a wonderful time where we can just sit back and reflect, you know, on all the good things and the bad, all the experiences that we've had, you know what I mean? And so just as a general introduction, this, again, is a huge field of study. It involves, you know, a large population in the United States and across the country. Many people are experiencing late adulthood, you know, as we are with, of course, all of the cohorts. But as we're going to see with this next slide, statistically, we're going to see that um, the, the late adulthood population, you know what, that is probably a politically correct term. So I'm just going to use that throughout this. So regarding the late, late adult population, as you guys can see, 65 years and older, just in the last you know, decade is increasing a lot. And then it's estimated by 2030 to be about 20% of the population. So, you know, one out of five people is going to be over 65 years of age, and that means four out of five people will probably have to pitch in at some point and help out this population. So a lot of countries are really having to cope with this. Like if you look at Japan, they're going to have half of their population is going to be a late adulthood stage. That means they're not going to be necessarily contributing to the economy, putting money into the taxes, things along those lines. And so a lot of countries are becoming aware that, there has been a rapid change since the 1940s and the 1950s, for example, when people were having more babies toward the 90s, 2000s, 2010s, and here we are in the 2020s where people are starting to have less babies. You know, And so as a result, you're going to have a large population that is you know, in a late adulthood stage. And so if you were to study things like demographics and then how demographics is associated with how society functions, again, it's a large process but again think about the influx of you know healthcare needs that we're going to have so healthcare is going to have to be a huge industry we're going to have to compensate for the la loss of tax money and so you always hear in this generation are we still going to have social security because who's really even going to be paying into it for example in china where they used to encourage having less babies all of a sudden realize that they're going to have such a large cohort of elderly people that Without a new group coming in to take care of them, that's going to also cause what could potentially be a social problem, for example. And so again, this uh, late adulthood population is the fastest growing uh, population in the U.S. One in seven Americans is currently 65 and older, and as you can see, in 10 years, it'll be about one in five. And again, this is because declines in fertility and improvements in longevity account for the increase, meaning that people are living longer and we're having less babies. And again, to answer the fertility question, you know, from a sociological perspective, women with higher, uh, women's rights has increased, education has increased, women's access to work and other opportunities has increased, people are waiting later to get married, people are waiting later to have babies, you know, and so there's a lot of socio uh, socioeconomic variables that account for this, but again, uh, I can put up some supplemental lectures on that um, with some population studies and demography. If you guys are interested, just email me about that. Um, but again, there has been some big changes. And so society will have to reconcile with the changes in the birth cohorts, for example. Um, so your book breaks it down to age periods during the late adulthood. So the ages that we're looking at now are what your, these are your books labels, not mine. The young, old, 60 to 74 old old 75 to 84 and then oldest old 85 to 99 and again these are all basically saying you are now old once you're 60 which is completely arbitrary again you've heard my stances on how we categorize people and the stage theories and how we should always critique these but these are just general arbitrary ways of categorizing people so for the sake of argument we'll just look at it like this you know, like middle adulthood was 40 to 60, young adulthood was like 20 to 40, you know, adolescence is like 10, 11, 12 to 18, 19, 20. And again, I don't even want to pinpoint those ages because it varies so much with each individual, for example. But again, as we've discussed, there are some general phases that we all kind of share throughout time as we go through these developmental changes and there are common patterns. And so again, we're looking at the common patterns. But again, your book breaks it down to the young old, pretty good stage in life still, experiencing good health, positive social engagement, showing strong performance and attention, memory, and crystallized intelligence. Again, they've lived for a while, lots of experience, lots of expertise, had a chance to build a good life if it's possible. They're not limited by like socioeconomic factors, for example. 
Then we have the old old, 75 to 84. Likely to be living independently, but this is when things start to kind of happen with our bodies, okay? Congestive heart failure, for example, is 10 times more common. And again, the average American, I think, lives to be about 78. And so you can see somewhere between old, old is the top of that bell curve. And after about 78 is when you start to see the bell curve kind of go down to the decline. And again, oldest old is considered 85 to 99. And again, this is when we generally experience the most uh, serious chronic ailments. This is 2% of our population. However, it accounts for 9% of hospitalizations. So as I was saying, as we have an older population, that's going to cause more demand on the healthcare system. So we as a society, you know, we'll have to construct a healthcare system to deal with these needs, make sure that we have the finances to cover this, for example. And then in countries that don't have this kind of infrastructure, like the United States, which it's globally is the 1%, like people in America, the average American makes 20,000 more than the next closest country to us. Um, but again, so we still have to cope with this, you know, and so uh, 85 and older are more likely to require long term care again, be in nursing homes and the youngest old 50% uh, of them require some assistance. Okay. And then centenarians is 100 plus. And again, that's just a miracle of life. And in your book even says, you know, this is a huge age period. It can go from 60 to up to 120, again, depending upon how long people live. But again, um, globally, I feel like I had some stats on here about how long we live. Uh, maybe I didn't, I probably didn't put it in the PowerPoint, but again, the, uh, yeah, about 78 is the uh, average lifespan in the U.S. All right, so psychosocial development during late adulthood. I just want to look. So I just want to, so hold one second. Yeah, here we go. Just uh, since we were talking about it, I'm just going to go ahead and pull up this slide. So again, life expectancy versus lifespan. Again, um, the global life expectancy is for those born in 2019 is 72 with females reaching 74.2 years and males 69.8 um, life expectancy in low-income countries 62.7 years is 18.1 years lower than the high-income countries again you can see that socioeconomic status is directly correlated with how we live how long we live for example and so countries with the infrastructure the healthcare systems to take care of a lot of things Countries that have good nutrition, diet, exercise, things along those lines, you start to see higher numbers. And again, you can see where people live the longest, you know, these darker green areas. And then uh, the you know, little U.S. is a little bit uh, darker than like, you know, Latin America or Asia and the lowest life expectancies here in Africa. And then you can look at it by uh, race and ethnicity. Hispanic females live the longest, followed by white females, followed by Hispanic males, followed by um, non-Hispanic black females, and then uh, white males, and then non-Hispanic black males. And there's a lot to this because, again, this is the biopsychosocial approach to understanding the thing, how the effect of racism on people, right? And so this chart here shows you why does a white male live longer than a black male for example, and why does a Hispanic male live longer than a white male, for example? And so again, this is a very hard question to answer, but one, right? Black males historically are stuck in poverty. And so people that are in poverty are more likely to experience um, less access to healthcare, less access to a good diet, um, more likely to be obese, things along those lines. Okay, so there's a lot of problems just associated with poverty, for example. And then why does a Hispanic male live longer than a white male, even though a white male tends to have so higher socioeconomic status? Now we might need to point to things like culture. What are the cultural differences between Hispanic males and white males that account for these disparities? And why does a Hispanic female live three years longer than a white female? Again, is this, you know, even though they are more likely to have less socioeconomic status than a white female, they still live longer. How much of this is associated with lifestyle or working or any of these different factors? And so we need to always consider why there's a disparity. Your book gets into why women longer from a biological approach, and this is also extremely complex, hence biopsychosocial. 
To answer all of these questions, we have to take a biopsychosocial approach. Is it genetics of black males that's causing them to not live as long, or is it the social context? And sometimes it's genetics, but with black males, it's the social context. But why do white females live longer than white males? That one is more biology and lifestyle and also some social context. It's, it's complex. But women live longer because here's in the words of your book, right? It's easier to make a female genetically than it is a male. OK, and then. That's what it says. The creation of a male individual requires a sequence of events at a molecular level that are more complex for than a female, which leads to more possibilities for errors, essentially. Also, women, because they have two X chromosomes, their genetics, their actual DNA, somehow picks the most viable of the Xs. So they get to pick an X from their mom and also from their dad. Whereas a boy can only get an X from a mom. And so somehow your DNA picks out the most viable DNA. It's super complex. Okay, this is in your book, though. It's really interesting. So you should make sure you read that part because it's fascinating. And then estrogen also. The estrogen levels are associated with better heart and circulatory systems. Um, for males, our frontal lobe grows slower. So maybe we're not making the best decisions compared to women. And also things like lifestyle changes, like are males living more risky behaviors? Are we exposed to more dangers in the environment? Things along those lines. And so I just want to go back and hit this slide up. Um, I'll come back to it in a second. But um, just to cover that really quick. Um, so that just kind of feeds into some of the disparities in age. But as you can see, Americans, oh, I should have pulled that up. So Americans, um, the global lifespan in, in U.S. it's 78.6, okay, but only 72 in across the globe. So you can also see that socioeconomic factors in the U.S. with healthcare access accounts for this disparity between countries and lifespan. And again, these are complex questions because we're having to take a biopsychosocial approach to ask why do some people live longer than others? And what are the variables associated with that? Which is biological sex, that's associated. Someone's race is associated. The uh, socioeconomic level of the country you live in or socioeconomic level of your parents, you know, and what kind of social class you grew up in. Why is a black female with a PhD more likely to lose her baby than a white female in America with only a high school degree? Again, was the black female more likely to be in poverty when she was young because she's black and white people oppress black people and black people are more likely to be in poverty as a result? Again, it's complex, but again, that's the social sciences. You got to be thinking about all this cool stuff, okay? All right, so psychosocial development during late adulthood. Hopefully I've covered a lot of this already. But again, it's integrity versus despair. Did you live your rock in life or not? And again, you see this kind of in every stage. It's like when you're a toddler, are you learning to be independent or are you not? When you're like an adolescent, are you becoming autonomous or are you not? You know, like, do you have your stuff figured out or do you not? And that's such a harsh approach. But again, that's an interesting way to kind of look at this because here we are reflecting on our life, asking, am I where I wanted to be 10 years ago or whatever it might be? Or I'm about to die. Did I do everything I wanted to do? You know, we are faced with these questions because of our conscious mind. The fact that we have evolved a conscious mind over time, we have the ability to reflect and we are aware of that question, how is the quality of our life? How do we feel about it? Are we happy? Are we doing what we want? So the task of adulthood, um, in middle adulthood, is about becoming the self that you want to be. And I talked about that in my last lecture. Like so, by forty, hopefully you're there. Like in your twenties, thirties, you're taking all the steps to get where you're trying to be. Hopefully by the time you're forty, you got the identity worked out. You got your life that you want. You got your good interpersonal relationships. You're healthy, right? You got all of this stuff, right? With the value of that life. Um, and so when you get to your older adult, then you're asking yourself, like, you know, have I, you know, how do I feel about that? Did I do everything I wanted to do? Like, you know, instead of just living it, you know, now you're like, well, my life is kind of ending. So maybe I need to ask that question. I don't know if it comes down to that or not. 
But your book says it comes down to whether you have built a life and constructed a self that is sufficient to withstand the disintegration of your physical body, the death of many you love, and eventually and inevitably strong enough to face your own impending death with indignity and grace. Okay, it's like, it's just so harsh. But I mean, is that what we do when we get older? Now we just sit back and we're too old to walk, so we just sit and think and reflect. I mean, is that the case, right? Uh, so your book talks about integrity okay, versus despair. Your sense of self-acceptance, contentment with your life, and imminent death <laughs> versus despair. Lack of fulfillment or peace, inability to come to terms with life, aging, and approaching death, right? Glass half full, glass half empty. I mean, I, that's basically what your book is kind of breaking down this stage down to. And I think it's it's not that clear cookie cutter. Again, it's far more complex because there's always the good with the bad, the ups and the downs. Maybe we're just trying to find that homeostasis or that sense of balance between the life we lived, the life we wanted, and the life that we have right at this second, you know? And I guess that acceptance that we're going to die one day. I mean, that's so sad. Face your impending death with dignity and grace, so says your book. And again, this is very generalized, <laughs> as you can see, not necessarily specific. So Erickson's wife, just to culminate Erickson's eight stages, his wife comes along with this idea of the ninth stage, and his wife had been working with them whole time. And they basically says that older adults revisit all the other eight stages we went through. We look back on our lives and ask ourselves, you know, how did we feel about our childhood? Were we happy? Were we excited in the way that we kind of left home and started going out in the world? Are we happy with the life that we built and experienced? You know, were we able to do everything we wanted? And now are we facing death with, you know, some integrity <laughs> instead of despair? I mean, that's basically what it's going down to. And so um, there's this term that your book talks about that I like called Jero Transcendensen Gerontology is the study of elderly populations, if that's a politically correct way to put it. Jero transcendence is a coined term by gerontologist Lars Tornstam. Again, it's this awareness of our own life, right? We are aware of the life we live. We can sit back and reflect. And now we're asking, how do we feel about it? Do we feel connected to the universe, right? Do we have good ties with our past? Are we happy with the life we lived? Are we positive and you have a good perspective about our life, right? And that's, I mean, again, what I've been saying this whole time, what's the purpose and meaning of life? I mean, that question in itself, no one has a true answer. Otherwise, we'd all know the answer by now. Yet, you know, maybe it's something we seek out. And why are we even seeking some sense of acceptance? You know, does our body want that for us? I mean, it's just so incredibly complex. <laughs> so, I don't know. These are just my own thoughts, you know. And if you read a bunch of books or whatever, you know, like Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, which started a whole field of psychology with logotherapy. Viktor Frankl's in a holocaust. He's sitting in a concentration camp watching people just be murdered an entire genocide happening before his eyes put yourself in that experience how do you cope and he talks about this flower he found a flower and this one flower got him through the darkness but he talks about how other people coped and he talks about the varying in the ways that people coped some did well with it some did not i mean again I can't even imagine, you know, the being in a Holocaust and what's going on in your mind. But that book is very, very powerful because it delves into that, right? Facing that imminent death. And then what's our attitude? What's our perspective on it? How strong of a person are you? How strong of a person do you have to be to be able to face it? But the thing is, all humans, whether we're strong or not, have to go through these phases of life. Hence, it can be tough. Hence, there is that struggle. But maybe we can also find a flower that helps us get through it. Uh, so your book has a ton of theories in this year. I'll just fly through them really quick. 
because um, I know it's hard to memorize all of these. Um, but activity theory, again, are we living an active life? You know, if we're in touch with others, we're being that creative life, what your book kept talking about is generativity, right? Where we're connected, we're involved, we're doing community things, we're volunteering, we're mentoring, we're giving back anything we can do. Also being active, not just sitting on a couch, very important. Continuity theory suggests as people age, they continue to view the self in much the same way. Just because we get older doesn't mean we totally change. As I'm saying, we do evolve over time. But again, as we discussed with personality, there's stability versus instability in our personality. Some remain stable across the lifespan, some don't. But again, I don't think that people necessarily go on the completely unstable side. We all generally have that kind of grounded sense of self somewhere deep inside, even if that gets a little bit mixed up, a little bit confused at times. So again, just because we're older doesn't mean we're necessarily thinking different or all of a sudden we want different things or I have to like put on old person clothes now. Just because I'm an adult doesn't mean I have to act like one. You know, I put that in my last lecture um, I think about growing up. I think it was something about growing up. I forgot. I don't want to pull it up and bore you guys right now. But socio-emotional theory, selectivity, socio-emotional selectivity theory. Again, once we get to this stage in our life, we become more selective about what we're going to waste time on because time is precious, <laughs> you know. And so again, it might be good to you know prioritize what's important to you. Um, and again, that's the idea of selective optimization and compensation too, like. Optimize our time to benefit the most rewards that we can. Developmental self-regulation theory, sense of self-efficacy, like again, that belief in ourself and confidence and competence that we can still do stuff. But just because we're aging and maybe we're not functioning as well as we used to doesn't mean we can't optimize our functioning and still rock it out. Hence, having that healthy diet, exercise, seeing doctors, maintaining that lifestyle as much as you can just doing the daily things can help so much, right? So again, generativity and late in life. How do we have that positive psychology, you know, live our life to the fullest extent, self-actualization kind of approach? So your book talks about, again, building that legacy, still finding productivity in work and creativity, volunteering, whether it's face-to-face -face or virtually, Interacting with children, friendships, education, continuing to grow, seeking out things you enjoy, golfing, whatever it might be, playing poker, political activism. But again, we all struggle with loneliness and then finding that balance where we like loneliness a little bit. I didn't mean to say that. I did not say that right. Finding the balance between loneliness and solitude. Because when I was reading this in the book, this, this always hits home because... The elderly population, for example, like, are they interacting with people as much as they need to? And so once you enter like late adulthood, are we losing ties with other people? And so again, it's imperative that we maintain social ties so that we don't experience anime or the disconnect from others, that normlessness or the loneliness. And again, your book talks about loneliness versus solitude is Loneliness is that need for others, but you're not getting it. And then solitude is, you know what, I'm fine on my own. Like, I'm happy sometimes by myself. And you don't always have to be with other people. But this is a time where it's important to stay connected, okay? And so, because we all need that. It's a human need, as we discussed several lectures ago. You need people. If people aren't in your life and they don't socialize you, you never develop in the first place. Like you only develop through social interaction. Babies on their own cannot survive. Kids would probably struggle until they're at least five to even make it in the wild, for example. We need other people in our lives. Your book does talk about things like relationships and you find that there are benefits to things like being married because it, it covers that need for other people. And so people that are married, for example, tend to live a bit longer. And then being widowed is associated with things like, you know, earlier mortality and things like that. So I've got some uh, lectures in my marriage and family uh, playlist, if you guys want to check that out on some of that, like the effects of divorce, the effects of death and marriages and things like that. Very interesting. Um, but again, you have different home lives, okay? 
everyone's got a little bit different. Some people have people, some don't. Some have one person, some have a bunch. Um, so it looks at, you know, what are the factors that help us later on in life? Do we need other people in our life? And so we all have our, you know, things that we, some people might be married, some people might be dating, remarried, cohabitating, living apart but together, divorced. Um, your book talks about the LGBTQIA plus community and how sometimes because of social stigma, they might have been separated from their parents or disconnected from their families. And so they, but the benefits are they interact a lot with community. And so you start to see a lot more community level support and friend level support and not necessarily immediate family. And then also things like our socioeconomic status effects that dictate, you know, overall quality and things along those lines. Um, your book goes off for so long about physical development. Um, so I'm just going to fly through it because it's depressing and sad. But, you know, if you want to know all the little details, you know, again, I showed you just a general section here of all the things that go on with your skin, hair, nails, height, weight, all of these changing. I'm shrinking. I'm shrinking. A total of one to three inches in height. Man. <laughs> So your heart thickens, your arteries become less flexible, your lung capacity diminishes, your kidneys become less efficient, your bladder loses control. Brain cells do lose some functioning, but again, through neurogenesis, we can be constantly creating new neurons. So don't just give up. Your brain is still rocking it out. Like your vision quality does decrease though. Loss of hearing, loss of taste due to smell loss. Again, your neurons in your nose, your olfactory, neurons just stop functioning at some point uh chronic pain scaffolding theory of aging and cognition um even though we're experiencing all of this though your brain can compensate same thing with like stroke victims when you study stroke victims like you stroke out in your left brain your right brain starts to compensate again so don't just give up have hope despite the sadness of it all and then again, cognitive reserve. Your book talks about the structure and dynamic capacities of the brain that bunk for against atrophies and lesions. Again, what happens if you get a head injury? Again, your other part of your brain can start to take over, for example. So, I mean, your book is, you know, the bilateral is very specific. Like the, the right part of your brain is much more artistic. That's the part of your brain that feels connected to the air. Your left part of your brain is your identity, that sense of self and that sense that you're separate from others, for example. And then, you know, math and music and all these things are, you know, you see a lot more activity in different parts of your brain, for example. But again, just because we're getting old doesn't mean our brain is completely going down. However, the central executive part of our brain that oversees working memory, allocating resources where needed and monitoring whether cognitive strategies are being effective does decline with age. Hence that loss of speed and efficiency in the gray matter that really starts in our middle adulthood, you know, but then by late adulthood, you start to see that in the gray matter and the white matter that's for our processing and conductivity. But again, don't give up hope. It doesn't mean we can't do stuff. But again, research shows that older adults are less able to selectively focus on information while ignoring distractors. Um, it, your book talks about driving. And again, it's because when you're driving, there's a lot of stimuli. And so you almost have to block out a little stimuli to be able to focus on the things that are at hand. And it's things like that that become harder with age, which is interesting. So it's almost like an attention deficit disorder and how that starts to kick in a little bit as age increases, for example. Um, episodic memory decline. So it says that our knowledge for facts doesn't really decline, but our memory for events does because our memory for events is, um, it requires a place and a time and it's more complex to store episodic memories than it is things like semantic memories, like facts, okay? Um, so, but again, just because we're starting to forget some things doesn't mean we're forgetting everything. <laughs> Man, so sad. Uh, again, but aging stereotypes exaggerate cognitive losses. Again, you might see it like you, you might have been told your whole life that all of a sudden we decline like that. But again, you know, I, I don't know. You, at what point does it totally decline? 90s, 100 is. I mean, we could still be rocking even then. But, you know, like I've seen my great grandmother or my grandmother and great grandmother in their 90s, you know, you start to see moments 
And then you have other things like dementia, Alzheimer's, all other kinds of factors that are, again, I'm not going to get too specific for all of this and get into all the psychological disorders also, but we have to consider all of these other factors and why that's going on. Is there some kind of decay in the brain? Same thing with our memories. Are we losing our memories because parts of our brain are actually starting to gray out? You know what I mean? It's complex. Um, yeah. But again, fluid versus crystallized intelligence. You are constantly learning more stuff throughout the lifespan. You're constantly learning new facts. You're constantly taking short-term memory and turning into long-term memory. And as long as you can hold on to your memory cues, you're good. But again, that's why it's important to use your brain and just be thinking about all this stuff because eventually you forget the name of that actor. I used to know all the names of the actors and over time, I don't remember them as much, but I should because that's semantic memory. So what's really happening? But it's probably because my memory of that actor is attached to a place in a time when I actually remembered it, remembered it, and so my memory cue itself is lost. So the knowledge of the actor is still in my brain, that's semantic memory, but um, my episodic memory is not as connected as it used to be, so I can't recall the event because I've lost the memory cue. That's all. I love sensation and perception, so if you guys get a chance to take that class, that's where you really delve into all of that kind of stuff, but... You know, it's complex. Again, wisdom growing, and then your book does introduce religion and spirituality because even if, even though religiosity is going down, you know, still the vast majority of the world still does have just belief in spirituality. And so we have to recognize that scientifically, that statistically, that's a big part of people's lives or it's a part of people's lives. Um, but having that strong relationship between spirituality and psychological well being, even if it's not religious. Again, there is some connections there to overall improvements in your psychological well-being. But again, it could just be having hope or believing in something or just being connected to something that really does it for us. And again, I've already covered this uh, whole chart here. But again, when it comes to death, dying, and bereaving, bereavement, you can see that there's inequalities across different variables like biological sex, race, region, country. Um, healthcare access, socioeconomic status, all of these things have to be considered in the process of aging. Um, theories of aging, why do we age? Program theories that follow a biological timetable, possibly a continuation of childhood development. Is it in your DNA to die at some point? That's basically what that means. Damage theories, emphasize environmental factors that cause cumulative damage in organisms. So again, um, how does the environment impose stress upon our bodies over time? So like, it's like a spacesuit, right? Even the best spacesuit will degrade over time in space. It's like that because of like solar radiation or whatever it might be. Even though it's protective against it, eventually, it's, or it's like a river, right? Like rivers carve canyons over time eventually the earth just gives out and can't hold back the water anymore and so erosion happens uh, genetics how much of your genes associated with how long you live um, blood fat levels cholesterol risk factors for heart disease early death a lot of that is built into your genetics cellular clock theory uh, aging is due to the fact that cells can't divide infinitely and your book gets into it. It's really interesting. It starts talking about how a cell can only divide so many times. And I think the number of times a cell can divide is 60. And then after 60 divisions, a cell can no longer divide. So again, we can only reproduce new cells so many times before we can't make them anymore. And if you can't make more cells, then you die. DNA damage. You know, somehow through epigenetics, environmental factors, can your DNA be defected? Mitochondrial damage, you know, uh, immune and hormonal stress theories, metabolic stress. Again, the stress imposed on the body to sustain life, such as circulating blood, eliminating waste, controlling temperature, uh, neurons releasing neurotransmitters, all these activities that keep the body alive create biological stress that over time you know, takes its toll, like it can only hold up for so long. Um, yeah, so there's just so much stuff. Life spot style is a factor, you know, how much are you eating and exercising, things along those lines. And the actual environment that you live in, like pollution, things along those lines are also a factor. And then just to kind of conclude it, dying and grieving across the stages. So you always have the classic Kubler-Ross theory, the five stages of loss experienced by someone who faces the news of their impending untimely death 
or someone dealing with it themselves. You know, we go through denial, like this isn't happening, anger, how could this happening, bargaining, how can I fix it, what can I do, depression, just having to cope with it, and the sadness that comes, and finally accepting it. There are huge cultural differences when it comes to our attitudes toward dying, our perspectives on dying, our cognitions of dying, how we treat dying, um, the traditions, you know, that we go through for this process. So that's an entire other conversation, but again, Culture has a huge role in the way we live our lives, our ceremonies, you know, our attitudes, what we think, the religion that we're socialized into is so associated with region and the culture we're socialized into. Again, if you're in the United States, you know, you're most likely to maybe be socialized into Christianity. But if you're in India, you're more likely to be socialized into Buddhism. And if you're in like North Africa, maybe, you know, um, Islam or judaism and if you're in asia it could be buddhism or confucianism and depending upon you know where you're at and what you were socialized into you know and then we're all globally interacting so of course we brought buddhism to america and all these religions are here too and you know but again so but each cultural each you know we all have our own kind of attitudes toward that um so something to think about from a sociological standpoint, again, healthcare, we have all these infrastructures to be able to deal with this, like nursing homes, uh, healthcare, like hospitals, um, cemeteries, you know, crematoriums, whatever it might be, funeral homes. And there's, you know, that's built into our economy, it's built into our healthcare system. Um, things to think about people start to create advanced directives, like planning out their will, what to do if this happens, for example, what to do with your organs. Um, and then how to deal with grief. And again, I don't want to spend too much time on this because it's so sad and depressing. But your book gets into all of this stuff and all the different types of grief, not only that we experience when we're going to die ourselves, but having to deal with the grief of having losing other people or animals or whatever it might be or that favorite tree in your front yard. Okay, So again, we can experience this prolonged and complicated grief that we might not even necessarily be able to understand, but for some other reason we feel it. Like why do humans have so much empathy? Why do we care about others? And again, that's built into our DNA because we're social people. We work in groups. To care is built into us. You know, and there's psychological disorders associated with that, like being a sociopath and not caring and being detached and not having those feelings. But again, we do care and we get affected right your book talks about anticipatory grief like the knowledge is going to happen survivor's guilt like why did they die and not me um general patterns of grief like how do we go through it but yeah your book gets into like the what happens when you lose a child you know how hard is that to cope with or you lose your wife what are you gonna do you know yeah so I leave that for a, another class, you know, <laughs> but we all have to face it as part of the end. So I appreciate y'all listening to this lecture series and hopefully this is not the end of my life, even though it's the end of this lecture series here on uh, introduction to developmental psychology. I wish you guys the best and uh, may you live your life to the fullest and achieve all of your dreams and be as successful as you can. And yeah. Peace out.